Here goes one more thing, like saying on the superjet the landing gear has punctured the fuel tanks. In 2009 in Amsterdam, while conducting an approach, a Turkish Boeing 737 crashed. The main contributing factor to the accident considered was a failure of the radio altimeter which was showing minus 4 feet while the aircraft was at a much higher altitude. Have you ever come across of such a failure? Please, read the Wikipedia at least. Yes, the radio altimeter failure took place there. However, the failure of the pilots happened well before it. They neglected everything that could have been neglected. The captain even ignored the opinion of the first officer who couldn't understand why the captain didn't get that the aircraft was in stall. Everything that should have warned the pilots about impending stalling had warned the pilots but captain didn't notice it while being too excited about the story he was telling. Yes, the failure has happened. But this was not the main factor. It was just a single failure. Failures happen. It happens, shit happens. That's why we are there, in the cockpit, to manage malfunctions. The airplane has shouted out everything that it should have to, about approaching to stall. And at the end they managed to stall it. That was not the radio altimeter which stalled the plane, but the pilots. They're in action, they're ignoring. Flight 1951 was descending on the glide path with its autopilot and auto throttle engaged. At a height of 2,000 feet the left radio altimeter indicated erroneous height of minus 4 feet, which in turn made the auto throttle set the idle thrust. The pilots should have disengaged the incorrectly operating auto throttle and increase the thrust. The errors in the indications of the radio altimeter triggered the oral warning, which sounds in case of retarding the throttles to the idle thrust with landing gear not lowered. Nevertheless, this did not draw pilots' attention. Meanwhile the captain was explaining to the first officer how to do the landing checklist. In the meantime, the airspeed dropped to 40 knots below the minimum speed for the approach, which led to the stall warning system activation at height of 500 feet. The trainee first officer advanced the throttles but did not disengage the auto throttle. After this, the captain took over the control of the airplane. The trainee released the thrust levers, and the auto throttle retarded the levers back to the idle thrust. Only six seconds later the engines were advanced to higher thrust, but it was too late to avert the accident. On April 25, 2010, the DSB published the preliminary investigation report. It stated that the landing configuration warning came on several times during the approach. The malfunction of the radio altimeter occurred periodically nine times in the preceding flights. In two of them the auto throttle was giving the same faulty commands to retard the thrust levers. It would be cool to relate every accident to a small malfunction. But will it be really cool? For me it would be a shame. What the hell is the reason that the pilots are still there in the cockpits? Kick them out. If a small failure occurs and that's all, the airplane crashes. Very often people speculate that everything happens because of pilots. This is a fact. The majority of aviation accidents happened because we, pilots, had missed something or somewhere. But people forget that a tremendous number of accidents didn't happen. Only because pilots didn't allow them to happen. In mass media this point is not being highlighted, this is considered as a routine pilot's duty. Thank you, you did your job, you are good guys. Sometimes they even don't say thank you. But when something happens, and if the pilot's error is obvious, then everyone hears about it. This is a law of life. But the fact is that accidents happen, rarely, but happen. And in all cases they involve a human factor. Let's look at the Boeing 737 MAX. The situation was not easy. But, if we go in detail, it appears that the situation became to be complicated after improper actions of the pilots. Should the pilots react appropriately to the very first indication that came on, the situation would have developed in a different way. Again, we are weak humans, we are not robots that always react correctly. Therefore, it happened as it happened. 3. Three identical cases, one crew coped with it, the other two did not. Somehow? Of course, when the situation developed, it became extremely difficult to manage it. This is the truth, this is a fact. But also, the matter of fact is, that in order not to reach that point, there were several quite simple actions that should have been executed. In the first accident it was hard as they departed at night. Sleepy, this was an additional factor. 
which impeded correct actions to be taken. When something happens, you immediately feel the stress and being under a stress, every human behaves differently. We can ponder a lot about how to cope with the stress, but it will not be totally effective. In the second case, the accident should never have happened. Firstly, they should have known everything about the first accident. We are pilots, we are professionals, we must have known this. We studied the first case thoroughly. We should have known how the MCAS worked and what to do. Nevertheless, when it happened to them, just take the preliminary investigation report and read it sentence by sentence. Everything what could have been done wrong, they did wrong. Lots of factors. The first officer was a rookie. He wasn't helping. The captain was confused. He also might have recalled something from the Boeing bulletin that also had not been very well written. And he switched off what should have been switched off a bit later. Firstly, the airplane should have been trimmed properly. Everything was working perfectly. MCAS trims it nose down, you trim it nose up. It was possible to be flying for hours without even knowing that MCAS exists. What he did, he let the horizontal stabilizer to get trimmed nose down, and then he disconnected its electric motor. That's it. It no longer works, you can only rotate the trim wheels by your hands. But the airplane is accelerating since the pilots have not done the actions of the airspeed unreliable checklist which was the first thing that he should have done. They left the engines at a high thrust, then, because the stabilizer had been trimmed nose down, the airplane was pitching down, and accelerating. Pilots were pulling up the yoke and additional force appeared on the stabilizer and this impeded it from being moved to the opposite direction. This was a deadlock situation. In order not to get killed, you are pulling it up. And besides the airstream pressure, which is already working against the movement, you deflect the elevator up. All this, blocks the stabilizer. It was impossible to manually return the stabilizer back with the trim wheels. It is written in the manual of our airplane, by the way. What could have been done? They should have just switched on the electric motor and trim the yoke forces. They did it. They switched the motor on. The trim started to work again. And then, for unknown reason they switched it off again. Now it is not possible to guess how it has happened, why this has happened. I mean, sitting here on a sofa, it is easy to talk. But we should talk about it. I've already said it emotionally when I talked about the super jet crash. We must know what and when our colleagues did wrong, in order to work better if we accidentally find ourselves in a similar situation. I can give an example. I can quote one of the book written by the famous Russian test pilot, Mark Galley, tested in the sky. A journalist entered the room, where the test pilots were fiery discussing the errors of a colleague who had crashed recently. It is ridiculous, he claimed, you are criticizing a man who was a friend of yours. How can you behave like this? It's almost the same what I was blamed 10 minutes ago for going against the pilot's solidarity. So, Mark Gallet says the same. We not only may discuss, but we must do it. We must know which mistakes has happened, in order not to repeat them. Here it's the same. From the outside it might look blasphemously when we are saying loudly, that a pilot, has made errors. But he did make them. We must know exactly, the nature of the errors. We analyzing them. We do not just read the safety related information, we study it. In order not to screw up. Yes, from outside it may look that we are not behaving nicely. Some pilots also blame, you shouldn't behave like this, and so on. We should, we must definitely know, what, why, and how. We must investigate it in order to not get screwed. Was there a possibility not to rush? Yes, there was such a possibility. Was there a possibility to fly the airplane while being removing forces from the yoke? Yes, there was a possibility. The first case. While the captain was flying, he managed to do it. He didn't understand what was going on, but he felt the force. I am now talking about the first crash of the 737 MAX. He was just removing the force, and the airplane flew nicely. But the first officer was really stuck. He was not able to find the checklist, which is on the top of the cover. He couldn't find the reference to it. By the way, this is a memory items checklist. He wasn't able to find the checklist for four minutes. The captain had to hand over the controls to him and to take the checklist. Again, why has he done this, as it was a memory items checklist. He was good at flying manually and not good at doing the checklist. And the other guy was not doing anything at all. He neither found the checklist nor he couldn't trim the airplane correctly after the captain had transferred the controls. When the captain realized that the foe was not trimming the airplane it became too late. The airplane was already in a deep dive. You made me talk a lot on the fifth hour of the stream. Alright, that's all.
Captain's decision, many thanks for your questions, for participating, for your support. I hope everything in your life will be nice, and great, and it's already nice and great. Goodbye, have a good night, we will see and hear each other again.